Today, I have Colonel Douglas McGregor with me to talk about the chaos going on in Europe with Putin and Ukraine. Uh, are we going to be drug into a Middle East conflict? Colonel McGregor, thank you so much for coming on today. Sure, thanks. So uh, I, I've been reading that Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine is accusing Putin and Russia of being behind the Hamas attacks on Israel and that there needs to be an international investigation. Is, is this his way of continuing to demonize Putin or is he trying to pull Ukraine back into the media or do you think there's any truth to his accusations? No, <clears throat> I don't see any truth in it. And I think he's trying desperately to do whatever he can to drag us back into the war because he knows that he's effectively on the road to being abandoned. He knows the money is going to stop. The arms have already stopped. The ammunition isn't coming. Uh, he's at the end of his rope. So I think he's probably ready to do or say anything that uh, promises to help him in any way. Yeah, okay. So uh, by, by following your work and, and uh, your contacts, we've, we've learned the truth that millions, tens of millions of Ukrainians have fled Ukraine. They have no plan of returning to the country. 500,000 plus Ukrainian soldiers have been killed or injured. Yet the war continues with Zelensky remaining confident that he can win. It is, again, is this Zelensky employing his acting skills or does he actually believe he can beat Russia and Vladimir Putin? No, I I think he's uh, more sober-minded than that. He's at the end, and he's going to say whatever he can to prop himself up to the bitter end. <clears throat> Who knows <clears throat> what sort of fate awaits him? <clears throat> I think there's a darn, darn good chance that uh, he may not survive in office. He uh, He's uh, offended, aggravated, angered millions of Ukrainians. He's led them down the path to total disaster. <clears throat> that usually ends badly for the leader. And then, of course, he's probably got a number of uh, escape routes planned to various places where his bank accounts and homes are located. But, you know, look, this war is over. You know, if you wanted any evidence for that, all you had to do was essentially look at the budget fight over the money. Suddenly now everyone who was uh, pushing war with Russia in Ukraine is now pushing war with the world inside uh, Gaza for Israel. Uh, so we, we've just essentially taken the same chorus, moved it to a different theater. They're singing the same kinds of tunes, <clears throat> hoping for a better outcome. I don't think the outcome is going to be good in either case, but you know that's another matter. <clears throat> Do you think, uh, or, or what would you guess, NATO leaders are telling Zelensky behind the scenes. Do you think that they're saying, hey, listen, we've we've supported you. We've given you more than enough. It didn't work out. And it's now time to get to the peace talk tables. Or do you think that they are still quietly behind the scenes, pumping him up with confidence that he can win this thing? I think he's probably being told privately that uh, it's over and that uh, he should probably step down graciously, which I don't think he can do, as I mentioned earlier, in favor of someone else stepping forward that the West can present as a credible representative of the you know remaining Ukrainian state, whatever that is, to sit down and negotiate some sort of end to the conflict with the Russians. I think any thoughts of uh, turning Ukraine into, into the contemporary equivalent of Napoleon's Spanish ulcer for Russia are, are over. I don't think anybody thinks that that's possible. I also don't see much evidence that anybody in Europe wants that to happen. So, you know, we're, we'll just have to watch. Now, I do see evidence that you still have some fighting. The Ukrainians are sort of clinging with their fingernails to the edge of the cliff. And the Russians are now pressing ahead. Anybody who thinks that the Russians are sitting still is wrong. This of Divka fight, which is sort of Bakhmut on steroids, I think is about over. <clears throat> After that, I'm not sure there's much left. Whatever Ukrainians are there that, that still constitute the army will want to retire to the Dnieper River and cross it and get out of the way. 
The question is entirely up to the Russians. What do they want to do? What are they going to demand? Are they going to offer any terms at all? To whom will they speak? They're certainly not going to pay any attention to anything we say. We've yet to tell the truth to them about anything. So the question is, who can step forward? I, I don't have that answer. I think they've got to wait, frankly, until there's some turnover in European governments <clears throat> and they have new leadership before they can expect anything from them. So, you know, the, the tragedy is not yet completely over, but for all intents and purposes, this is a, this is the end. In other words, <clears throat> this is similar to the situation that existed after we crossed the Rhine and the Soviets reached the outskirts of Berlin. Uh, Zelen Zelensky has also said that Putin is taking every opportunity to undermine Ukrainian uh, democracy and elections. But it, isn't it Zelensky that's not allowing elections in order to keep himself in power? Well, what do you want? I mean, the man's already said that there will be no elections in Ukraine for the foreseeable future. He's effectively banned uh, the Orthodox Christian church uh, from operating in Ukraine. I mean, it's, it just go down the Bill of Rights. Uh, who has any rights left? I'm not sure there are many rights that cannot be uh, discarded with impunity by him. He has still has a substantial uh, SBU or Ukrainian secret police behind him, which looks more and more like the NKVD under Stalin, <clears throat> rounding up people, forcing them into uh, uniform or disappearing them, if you will. I, I wonder what's going to happen to this uh, Gonzaga Lira, uh, who is sitting in a Ukrainian jail because he was honest and told the truth about events on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, apparently, he he's he's simply being left to rot in prison. Uh, the State Department doesn't seem to be interested in the man, even though he's an American citizen. It's a very tragic situation. But, you know, that's a that's a good uh, warning for everybody, including people like me, what you can expect from this administration if you're in trouble. Yeah, uh, probably because uh, Gonzalo Lira was not beating the drum that Washington, D.C. wanted. Uh, and so they're like, we're, we're, we're not going to back a journalist who isn't uh, putting out the, the narrative that we demand as if he was Twitter or Facebook or Google or something like that. Uh, yeah. Do you do you think that uh, you know in the last couple of days uh, there's been multiple drone attacks on the capital of Ukraine? Do you think that uh, Putin and the Russian Federation Army ha have they been attacking the capital this whole time, and it's just now coming into the news, or is this something new as they try to get people to the the peace talk tables? What what do you think is going on there? Well, they've launched attacks at targets that they could identify as uh, having some military value or political military value. Uh, it's been episodic, but I think they are very definitely ratcheting up the pressure because the, the Ukrainian forces are now actually defecting in large numbers. We've always had numbers of Ukrainian commanders that surrendered smaller units because they couldn't evacuate their wounded. They didn't want the wounded to die, and they knew that the Russians would provide them with better care. I mean, one of the problems inside the Ukrainian military from day one has been a very inadequate structure for medical treatment and evacuation. So that <clears throat> that much is, uh, is, is persistent. I, I think they're ratcheting up the pressure because they're going to close in on Kiev. They're going to roll up to the Dnieper River. There's no question about it. There's, frankly, there's not a whole lot out there to stop them. And I think they have hoped that, that someone would sober up in the West and step forward and say, let's talk, enough's enough, you've won, uh, let's see what your terms are. Uh, but no one's done that. And until somebody does, there is no incentive for Russian forces on the ground to stop. Okay. For, but from everything you've seen, is this, you know, NATO's been telling us, oh, you know, you watch, they'll they'll go for the capital next, then they'll roll into Poland and Eastern Europe. Or is this just the, the natural consequence of war that, hey, you know, in order to get someone to surrender, you go for you go for the flag, you go for the capital. Again, I <clears throat> I think that is probably on everybody's mind right now in Moscow. 
But having said that, we've got to keep a certain number of things clear in our minds. First of all, when the Russians initially intervened, everyone said, oh, look at this pitiful force. It's too small for the mission. There aren't enough Russian troops. They don't know what they're doing. Well, they were half right. Uh, Putin had never intended to invade and strike all the way to the Dnieper River. I was one of those who was surprised because I thought that the Russians would behave as historically they've done when it became clear they had no alternative. They would drive hell-bent for election deep into Ukrainian territory to try and rapidly encircle and destroy what was there. That didn't happen because I don't think Putin accurately calculated the response he was going to get from the West. I think he was surprised at the enormous hostility and hatred that emitted from uh, Washington, D.C. and other European cas uh, capitals. So now they've got the force uh, available that could take them all the way to the Polish border without question. But again, it's not really what he wants. Uh, the Russians don't want to rule the Ukrainians in the West. They know the Ukrainians in the West are true Ukrainians. These people have never lost their sense of identity or their cultural foundation, their language. They are different from the Russians. The Russians don't want to be burdened with that. Everybody thinks, well, they want to restore the Warsaw Pact. Why? The Warsaw Pact was no great benefit by the time the thing fell apart to the Russians. Cuba is another example. It was a disaster, just a, a, an open black pit for Russian money and resources. So he doesn't want to do that. Everything is a function of, well, who's going to step forward and who's going to take ownership? Who's going to admit the war is over? That hasn't sorted itself out in the West yet. So between now and Christmas, I would suspect that he'll simply press to the Dnieper River. And that's a natural dividing line. That that line will, will be seized. Then the next question is, who's going to negotiate an end to it? And if nobody comes forward and nobody's left, well, then you can cross the river and go into Kiev and decide what, what you want there for a government. The Russians will not accept a rump Ukraine as a member of NATO. Off the table. It, it's impossible. The Russians will not accept a government in Kiev that is incurably hostile to Russia. Why would they? In other words, no more platforms for attack against Russia. What they wanted was an Austrianized Ukraine, some sort of state that would be friendly with, but not necessarily hostile to Russia. In other words, it would not be part of a hostile alliance. I think they're going to get it, but we're not there yet. We'll just have to wait uh, and see what it develops in Europe. In, in Washington, nothing will happen. I, d I don't know if people realize it, but just take one look at Washington, D.C. It's paralyzed. It's paralyzed with a mix of arrogance, ignorance, and stupidity, in my judgment. They have failed consistently in every single important category of foreign and defense policy. The defense establishment is in ruins. We can't recruit for an army that can fight. We don't have the resources to send anywhere. We don't have any additional ammunition left. We have to replenish our own stocks. We have open borders. Millions of people have poured into the country. We don't know who they are, but they're increasingly an enormous economic burden. We have a failing economy and a deteriorating financial situation. Despite what you hear on the mainstream media, everybody says, everything's great. Oh, there's a bull market. Well, let's all get in there. Forget it. Only a fool would do a thing like that. I remind people that in June of 1929, Secretary of the Treasury Mellon told the American people, we live in an era of unbroken prosperity. There is nothing to fear. Meanwhile, he was liquidating all of his own stock holdings, investing heavily in gold and cash. And he wasn't the Lone Ranger. People lie. And the bunch in Washington is standing on a mountain of lies. Now they've taken this Israeli problem on, and they've done the worst possible thing. Instead of sitting down and saying to the Israelis, look, we're not in a position to fight a major regional war. We cannot promise you unconditional support you're going to have to limit the scope of your operations. That may change in the future, but today, these are the limits. Nobody said that. We're back to what we told Zelensky. You have the scientific, industrial, military power of the United States and NATO behind you. You are going to win. We will give you everything. Well, I think that's what Mr. Netanyahu is also counting on. It's not going to happen.
Yeah. Wow. Uh, we can barely do one war, let alone two. And yet they tell the American people, we're America. Of course we could do two. Yeah. Bring on China while you're at it. My gosh. Yes. It's just monumentally stupid. Yeah. So uh, just a couple of days ago, I had uh, General Michael Flynn on my show. He said uh, one of the things he was investigating before the deep state made their move to remove him from the Trump cabinet, uh, that there was an awful lot of money laundry uh, laundering happening from the Pentagon through military operations. Uh, the day before I interviewed him, the Pentagon failed an audit saying we can't account for $3 trillion. $3 trillion is, is the amount of money that they bring in in tax collections from every American combined. So do you, do you think there's any truth to what General Flynn is saying, or is it just hard to track money and weapons when you're in the heat of war? Well, that's a great excuse. The next time I plan to go to war, I can forget about stealing money and, and plussing up my bank account. <clears throat> I don't know the details. I'm sure he would not say such a thing if it were not true. So I, I impute credibility to his statement. I think he's he's on to something. But look. And now a quick message from today's video sponsor, Morgan & Morgan. In 2020, there were over 5 million auto accidents. That's more than 600 an hour. 600 an hour. And those in an accident may be entitled to more than they think. A few years ago, I was injured in an auto accident. At first, I didn't want to hire a lawyer because I felt bad for the woman that hit me, but I learned from the law firm that they would be going after the insurance company to make me whole and not the woman. Morgan & Morgan have modernized the injury law process so you can submit a claim and communicate with your legal team all over the phone. So if you're ever injured in an auto accident, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. You can submit a claim in eight clicks or less without having to leave your couch. For more information, go to forthepeople.com forward slash Stephen Gardner or dial pound law. That's pound 529 from your cell phone. All right, let's get back to today's news update. No one in Washington is interested in a real audit of anything. We can't audit the Fed. I think you'd have trouble auditing a lot of the senators in their personal finances as well as in the public ones. I, I think the entire structure of our government has fallen apart. People don't realize how fragile our government is at this point. The rest of the world looks at us and they see the old American brand. Oh, America is powerful. There's no one that can challenge the United States. Its military is all powerful. It's this, that, and everything. Those days are over. That's 30 years ago. That's 1991. Today, everything has changed. We've had enormous demographic changes. We have enormous discontent inside our country with a whole range of people for very, very serious reasons. We don't have societal cohesion anymore. Go back and look at the, the days of uh, uh, Gulf War I. Look at the uh, attitudes that people held at that point and how people reacted to what was happening, and then look what's going on now. The, the point I'm trying to make, and I've said this several times, the last thing the United States needs at this point in our history is a war of any kind. We have too much to do here at home. We're already spending a trillion dollars plus uh, every year now to service our enormous sovereign debt. You know, normally your creditors, and we have creditors, will come to you and say, look, it's obvious your head's underwater. You've got to cut spending. If you cut spending, we'll restructure your debt to enable you to pay it. That's what you do. That's what Franklin Roosevelt did in 32 and 34. He didn't call it a default. They called it restructuring the debt. Can we do that now? It's probably too late. Who holds most of the debt, internally and externally? Well, that's another lengthy explanation, but let's be frank. The Saudis, the Chinese, the Japanese, the British, other Europeans, they hold most of the debt. Do they ever really expect to be paid back? I, I think they've reached a point now where they see no evidence that we will ever cut spending. So where are we headed? Steve, we're headed over the cliff. In fact, some people say we've already gone over. 
And it's only a matter of time until we hit the bottom. When you hit the bottom, that's when everything will change. But until then, people are going to keep doing what they've always done because they've gotten away with it. So I think General Flynn is right. And I think it's the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Yeah. Wow. Oh, uh, some of this stuff gives me nightmares to to read about. Well, the bad news is that most Americans are still not paying a great deal of attention. Most Americans think things can be handled or, you know, the government will fix it. I mean, my generation is in receipt of, you know, their retirement checks, pension funds, uh, whatever savings they have. They're all settling in for a comfortable retirement. And I've tried to tell them what, what happens if the checks stop. What do people do when the food stamps stop? Oh, well, that will never happen. Gee, I, have we ever heard that before? That will never happen. I mean, Billy Mitchell predicted that uh, the Japanese were the most likely candidate to bomb Pearl Harbor. He, he made that prediction originally in 1922. And it was repeated subsequently. And people at times said, oh, well, that's ridiculous. Why would they ever do that? Well, we're, we're in the same position now. We've grossly underestimated everything, and we're underestimating the Middle East. And this is the real danger that we confront there. It's similar to what we did in Eastern Europe with the Russians. We underestimated the Russians. We decided they were weak and that we were far stronger than we are. We said their society would fragment. Ours is the one in trouble, not theirs. We said their economy would falter, but it's our economy that's in trouble, not theirs. I mean, we just go down the list. So I think we're doing something similar now in the Middle East. And I think it comes at at great cost to Israel. Yeah. Uh, but before we jump in there, I want to ask you something. This may be a little silly, but but it's a big story in the news today. Um, there's a, a retired colonel. I don't know if you know him or not. His name is Colonel Carl Nell. He came out to uh, today and said that the United States government, the CIA, and secret UFO programs need to come clean by 2030 and share their secret knowledge with each other in order to give the United States an advantage over the rest of the world before it's too late. <laughs> Any idea who this guy is? Why, why is a retired colonel coming out and making it sound as if the, these different entities are all hiding UFO technology that would benefit the United States? Uh, I I really don't know. You don't, you I mean, don't know him? No, I, okay. I, I assume he's an Air Force officer, but he could be an Army officer. I, I have no, no knowledge whatsoever of him. And by the way, you know, the entire uh, discussion of aliens is very obtuse. I mean, I've seen plenty of evidence to suggest it's quite real. I've seen plenty of evidence to suggest it's absolutely nonsense. I am not in a position to judge any of it. So I I I don't know, but I've learned that a lot of things are are probably true that we don't know. And so at some point the truth will will come out. Look, we're still arguing over the Kennedy assassination. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot that we don't know. And I think once this government implodes, and I think it will, I think it's it's headed to rock bottom. We may discover some things. We may find out some things. But until it does, everything that you just mentioned is pure speculation. Yeah. Okay. It, it was on the the front page of the Daily Mail. You're a colonel. He's a colonel. I thought I would just throw it out there. Okay. So we're not uh, we're not all electronically linked, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Cu couple of questions, and then I know you have to get off. Um, <laughs> Since the October attack on Israel, the U.S. military has had uh, an increase in attacks in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, do you think as the Israel-Gaza situation continues that the United States military bases and units will become increasingly under threat around the world? Well, I don't know about around the world, but very definitely inside the Islamic world. Uh, when I was in the building and before I went into the building and I first interviewed with the president for a, another position, I warned about the situation in Turkey. I felt strongly that we should get our forces out of there. If you go back to 2003, you will remember that the Turks denied us access to moving our forces through Turkey into Iraq. And everyone was shocked. 
and but nobody knows the the truth or the historical record when we first went in to iraq the the turks were apoplectic they were apoplectic because the turks of course regard the iranians as a rival they saw saddam hussein for a whole range of reasons as essentially a bulwark against iran they didn't want us to go in there and to stabilize the country and they knew because iraq is another artificial construct it's it's not a real country in the sense that we think of ourselves in Europe as nations. You could argue that we in the West, in the United States, are an artificial construct in many ways. We weren't always that way, but increasingly it looks that way. But that's not true uh, in the Middle East. Uh, Iraq was drawn up along with Jordan and a number of other countries at the Versailles P Peace Conference. So they, they said, look, it's he may not be perfect, but the country is stable. We can do business with it. We can live with it. And he's focused primarily or disproportionately on Iran. We ignored it. We went back in in 2003 and did more damage. We created the Kurdish monster in many respects that now threatens or has been threatening Turkey for some time, despite Mr. Erdogan's best efforts to try and tame that. So the, the Turks look at us and say, you're nothing but trouble. You, you've caused us unending heartache. Same thing is true in most of the Arab countries. But I think we need to understand that. And Americans, they don't. You know, we're back to this. So the Americans wear the white hats. We're the good guys. We come in. Peace, love, and, and harmony burst out from every direction. No, it's not the case. So we need to get those troops out. Donald Trump wanted to get them out when, when uh, I was there in November and December and, and early January. He wanted them out of Iraq. He wanted them out of Syria. And he was obstructed. He was obstructed by his own party on the Hill. Uh, he was obstructed by numerous lobbies uh, because the argument was, <clears throat> well, we have to stay there because of the Iranian threat. Well, the Iranian threat was already in Iraq. The Iranians have been running the show there almost from November of 2003 until the present. We could never have had any modicum of stability in that country if the Iranians hadn't intervened with the Shiites in the South so that we could deal with the Sunnis in the middle by either buying them off with cash or killing them. So the whole thing has been a facade of stability that was never there. We need to get out. Syria is another one. And our positions in these countries are, by any stretch of the imagination, illegal. The Iraqi parliament voted us out back in 2020, said, get out, leave our country. So much for our respect for dem democracy. We said, oh, sorry, can't do that. We're staying. Syria is another case. We are there illegally. There's nothing there that justifies our presence or control of this tiny oil spot that's up in the northeast of the country. And now we are viewed as, as unwanted aliens and potentially threatening, not just to the Iranians and, and the Iranian proxy of militias, but by the Sunnis and the Turks. <clears throat> so we need to get out, but we won't get out. We'll stay, and things are going to get a lot worse. And it's going to be very difficult to rescue them. A friend of mine in the building <clears throat> gave me a good comparison. It's a bad, bad thought, but uh, it worries me a great deal. Most of, most of your viewers will not remember World War II and, and Wake Island. Wake Island was this tiny island out in the vast Pacific. It was important to us for many reasons strategically, but it was indefensible. It was too small, couldn't possibly be defended. We wanted to get troops out, but we couldn't. So the Marines that were on wake were lost. They were captured and, and went away. The same thing was true in the Philippines. We tried to get out of the Philippines through most of the 1930s. FDR actually empowered MacArthur with the president of the Philippines to make a deal for neutrality for the Philippines so that we could avoid a war with the Japanese in the event that they decided to seize the Philippines. <clears throat> All of these things failed. So we had 11,000 American soldiers captured on Bataan. We had 1,000 plus Marines and sailors captured on Wake Island. We have a history of this. This is not good. And once the enemy holds your soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, what are you left to do? What's your answer? Global war, total war, world war? Uh, why wait for the inevitable to occur? So I, I think we should get out of all of these places, but I hold the minority opinion. Yeah. Oof. Okay, just a couple more questions, then we'll get you out. I appreciate your time. Um, Saudi Arabia has called for an end uh, to the carnage happening in Gaza. 
Prince Mohammed bin Salman has said, if Israel doesn't stop these illegal attacks on Palestine and Gaza, that he will wake up the Middle East against Israel. Is this a credible threat? Um, what, what are your thoughts on his comments? I think uh, they've already begun the wake up call. So I, I think he's absolutely serious. Now the Saudis and, and the Emirates, uh, Egypt, uh, in particular, several other North African countries, they have a weapon at their disposal in terms of oil and gas. In the case of Saudi Arabia, it has the weapon known as the U.S. Treasuries. If it simply dumps all of the treasuries it, ho it holds, that could start a fire sale here because our banks hold vast quantities of these treasuries that were bought when the interest rates were very, very low that now have really no value. If, if those things begin, uh, that's going to have a huge impact here. But from a military standpoint, the one actor in the region that is should be taken very seriously is Mr. Erdogan in Turkey. And I wish people would look at the remarks that he's made over the last couple of weeks. And he said several things that everyone should listen to this man. He is not hot air. He's real. He leads the Muslim Brotherhood in the Middle East, he leads it in North America. He is a believer. He is quite serious. And he said recently, speaking directly to Netanyahu, you, Mr. Netanyahu, are finished. You're gone. We are not talking to you anymore. It's over. Then he said, you, Mr. Netanyahu, are quick to threaten others in the region with your nuclear power. Let me be clear, all the nuclear weapons at your disposal will not rescue you. You will not survive this. And then he said, at some point, Turkish soldiers will fight in Gaza. Now, those need to be combined with what uh, the, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia said, because you're looking at two sides of the same coin. One, ki one kind is military power. The other coin is primarily economic. You have the Suez Canal, you've got the Straits of Hormuz. What does it take to shut them down and block them? Not a great deal. And then you have Iran. Iran is not like Turkey. Its population is not violently anti-Israeli. It isn't, it's very upset by what's happening. But the Iranians are much more moderate in their views. Unfortunately though, the Iranians know that if they are to be taken seriously in the region and by the Islamic world, they have to take Gaza very seriously, and they've done that. They have an enormous arsenal of tactical theater ballistic missiles, as well as cruise missiles and unmanned systems. They have enough of them ready to shoot, ready to launch, that they could destroy much of Israel's urban terrain, in other words, its cities. We haven't even discussed the, the Turks yet. I'm talking about Iran. The biggest mistake we could make would be to attack Iran. And pointing to Iran and blaming them for what happens in Iraq and Syria is infantile. Those militias want us out of their countries. That's what it's about. Get out, you're not wanted. And the people that have been working to bring on a war with Iran for over a decade are saying everything they possibly can once again to indict Iran and provoke a war with it. We remember President Trump went through this in 2019. You had Bolton at the time and Pompeo, McKenzie and CENTCOM, all these people were, well, it's Iran, it's Iran, it's Iran. We literally set them up to shoot down the global hawk and then said, that's it. And oh, by the way, Mr. President, we have the strike packages ready to go. And President Trump said two things. First of all, how many people did we kill with the global hawk? Well, of course, none. It's unmanned. And there was no pilot. Oh, well, then what happens after we launch the strikes? What a great question. What, what happens if we land troops in South Vietnam? Uh, well, we'll see what happens. We're going in. Uh, we're going to march in. We're going to do these things because it's the right thing to do. This is the problem. This is the threat to the United States. The existential threat to our country and our society is no afterthought, impulse, emotion, passion. There is no strategic reason for direct combat between ourselves and Iran. 
Neither is there any reason for that between ourselves and Russia or between ourselves and China. We are on in other people's countries, in other people's neighborhoods, trying to dictate outcomes. That's over. We are not the great superpower of 91, and they have all recovered and become infinitely more powerful economically, militarily over the last 30 years. We need to understand that however much we want to be, we are no longer the center of the universe. We are not the sole sun in this galaxy. We don't seem to want to come to terms with that, Stephen. Yeah. And that's our great problem right now. Yeah. Oof. I know you got to go. Uh, this has been very insightful. I, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, you are valuable. We thank you for your service and your continued service of coming on shows like mine so that the rest of us can understand what's going on. Thank you very much. And I, I hope you have a great rest of your day. And happy Thanksgiving to you and all of your listeners. Yep. Same to you. All the best. Bye-bye.